Hello. In this video, we'll introduce a special kind of group isomorphism called an automorphism. Our desired outcomes for this video are the definition of automorphisms and the automorphism group of a group G, and that you learn and understand some fundamental facts about automorphisms, like that they themselves form a group, and what the automorphism group of Zn is isomorphic to. Well, let's introduce our discussion by taking a look at these two Cayley tables. You'll notice that they're both Cayley tables for Z4, but for some reason the elements are listed in a different order in the rows and columns on the right. Comparing the two tables, though, we'll see that they have the same structure. It's almost like they're the same table, though we renamed or translated the ones on the left to threes on the right and the threes on the left to ones on the right. Well, based on our comparing of Cayley tables in the last video or two, you might expect that uh, these, the group on the left is isomorphic to the group on the right with a correspondence of zero mapping to zero, one mapping to three, two mapping to two, and three mapping to one. That should be an isomorphism. And we already knew that Z4 was isomorphic to itself because, of course, you can take the two Cayley tables shown here and notice that mapping each element to itself does give you an isomorphism as well. But this map above is a different, maybe interesting new isomorphism, and maybe it would be interesting to look at isomorphisms from a group to itself. It turns out that that's a thing, and that thing is what this video introduces. Our main definition in this video will be that of automorphism. Now, as the auto in automorphism suggests, Given a group G, an automorphism of G is an isomorphism from G to itself. Now here's a question you should uh, pause to answer. True or false, every automorphism of a group is a permutation. Now why don't you stop and think about that now? Okay, the answer is true by definition. Remember, a permutation of a set is a bijective map from the set to itself. An automorphism maps a group to itself, and like all isomorphisms, it is a one-to-one -one and onto function. So yes, automorphisms are permutations of the group elements. They're just special operation-preserving permutations. Because we can think of automorphisms as permutations of the elements of G, though, in this and later videos, I'll often write down specific automorphisms using the same array notation we had for permutations. I'll list the group elements on the top row and what each is mapped to by the automorphism on the bottom row. So for instance, the two maps from Z4 to itself from a minute ago could be represented like this, where the map G was the automorphism that mapped 1 to 3 and 3 to 1, and the identity map I maps everything in Z4 to itself. So, with that convention decided upon, let's talk about why we should study automorphisms. Why do we care about these maps from G to itself? Well, one set of reasons comes from thinking of an automorphism like the symmetry of a shape. If you'll think back to our discussion at the beginning of the course, we defined symmetries as motions that preserved the appearance of a shape. Now, analyzing which motions were allowed gives us a way of describing the structure of the shape and an understanding of which features of the shape are alike or the same and which are different. For example, looking at this rectangle, we might say that all the corners are alike in some sense. Since using a rotation or a reflection, I can lay any corner of this rectangle in the same position as any other corner and have the rectangle still look the same. Similarly, the top side of this rectangle is in some sense the same kind of thing as the bottom side, since rotations or reflections can swap these two long sides. However, no symmetry of the rectangle will end up placing this long side in the space currently filled by a short side, so the fact that there are no symmetries that do this reflects the fact that long sides and short sides are not the same kind of thing. We see that the symmetries allow us one way of differentiating between things that are the same kind of thing and things that are not. 
Other useful things about symmetries include that they are appealing to our eyes, they're visually pleasing, and, and this is why we talked about them at the beginning of our course, the symmetries of any shape form a group when your operation is composing those symmetries and groups get us excited. Okay, now back to automorphisms. In much the same way that symmetries help us to understand shapes, automorphisms help us to understand groups. As we look at which elements can be mapped to which, automorphisms can help us decide which elements are like others or not like others. And like symmetries, automorphisms can be pleasing to our eyes or other areas of our brains. You know, there are often nice patterns involved. And now that we think about symmetries, it seems natural to ask whether these maps from a group to itself themselves form a group in the same way that the symmetries of a shape form a group. Is there a connection there? Well, the answer to that question is yes. The set of all automorphisms of a group G is itself a group with the operation of function composition. We call this the automorphism group of G, and we can indicate that set by writing aut of G, A-U-T, of G. Now, before we talk about the proof of this theorem, let's see a couple of examples. Here we have listed the elements of the automorphism groups of the dihedral group of D3 and of the group U of 15. Now, remember, each element of these groups is an automorphism, which is a function that maps the elements of the group shown here on the top row of each of these arrays to the elements listed on the second row of the array. We could put two of these uh, group elements together by composing them like we would with other permutations written in array form. We would take each element of D3 and kind of trace what it gets mapped to as we apply one permutation and then the other. So for instance, if we composed these two automorphisms here on the right, the one on the top composed with the one on the bottom, we would take R20, for example, and apply the later permutation first, the later automorphism first, where one R120 is mapped to R240, and then the other automorphism maps R240 to itself. So overall, we started with R120, we ended at R240. Now, if we start with F, it gets mapped to F double prime, and then F double prime is mapped to F prime. So overall, F ends up at F prime. Now scanning through all these automorphisms, we see that this one here is the automorphism that sends R120 to R240 and sends F to F prime. So the composition of these two automorphisms, this one with this one, is this automorphism. Now, if we were to compose every one of these automorphisms with every other one, we could fill out a Cayley table for the automorphism group. And though we won't go through all the details here, doing so would show us that the automorphism group of D3 has the same structure as S3. Ought of D3 is isomorphic to the symmetric group of degree 3. Similarly, these eight automorphisms of U of 15 turn out to be a group with the same structure as D4. That is, aught of U of 15 is isomorphic to the symmetry group of a square, which is kind of interesting. So with these examples in mind, let's think about how we would prove this theorem. We'll notice that the theorem states that these automorphisms form a group. To prove that, we can just show that this set and this operation satisfy the requirements of the definition of a group Specifically, we'll probably have at least four sentences in the proof where we go through why this set and this operation satisfy closure, associativity, the existence of the identity, and the existence of inverses. Now, we won't go through all the details, but we will mention a few of the high points, starting with closure. Notice that in this situation, what we need to show is that putting two automorphisms together through composition forms another automorphism. So if F and G are arbitrary automorphisms, we need to show that F composed with G is a bijective map from G to G that is operation preserving. 
Now the composition of two bijections is a bijection, so that's not too bad. And to show that f composed with g is operation preserving, we would check whether f composed with g of ab was equal to f composed with g of a put together with f composed g of b. Now we see that's true here. The first equality here comes from the definition of f composed with g. The second one is true because g is an operation preserving automorphism. The third one is because f is also operation preserving. And then the last equality happens because the definition of f composed with g. Now function composition is always associative, so this group's operation satisfies the associativity requirement. Now odd of g has an identity. It's simply the automorphism that maps every element of g to itself. Now this is an automorphism, but there's nothing too interesting or surprising about this one, so we will call this particular automorphism the trivial automorphism. Finally, our proof needs to show that for each automorphism, there is an automorphism we can compose with it to produce the trivial automorphism. And the inverse function of an automorphism will satisfy that requirement. We can show that it is an automorphism, and composing it with our given automorphism will produce the identity of this group. So there are some details we'll leave out for you to fill in if you'd like the practice, but hopefully the outline of this proof is clear and you're convinced that the automorphisms of G, like the symmetries of a shape, do form a group. Now here are examples of automorphism groups again. I'd just like to point out that not much here should be obvious to you. I have not told you how I know that these are automorphisms and I haven't told you how I know that um, these are all the automorphisms of, of D3 or of U of 15. And I certainly haven't proved that this automorphism group is isomorphic to S3 or that this automorphism group is isomorphic to D4. It turns out that a fair amount of work goes into uh, showing all these details. And if you're up for a fairly rigorous exercise, you can try to fill in the details yourself. I would just give you the advice of paying very close attention to the facts about isomorphisms from our last video. Now in the next video, we'll have a bit more to say about how to come up with automorphisms for a group. Before we end this video though, let's see a cool theorem that connects automorphisms with the group Zn and the group U of n. This theorem tells us exactly what the automorphism group of Zn looks like, namely it's isomorphic to U of n. So as an example, the theorem says that ought of Z8 should be isomorphic to U of 8, which consists of the four numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7. And in fact, there are four automorphisms mapping Z8 to itself. Here they are, and you'll see that the patterns here do seem to be connected to the numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7. Specifically, these are the numbers that 1 gets mapped to. We won't write the full details out here, but if we were to write a Cayley table for these uh, four automorphisms and the Cayley table for U of 8, you would see that the two Cayley tables have exactly the same patterns because the groups are isomorphic. So for the last question of this video, let's ask how you would prove this theorem. Well, the theorem is a statement that there exists an isomorphism from one of these groups to the other. So to prove this, we'd probably want to say what that isomorphism was, and we want to show that the function we specified did satisfy all the requirements for being an isomorphism. So here are some comments on that proof. In the interest of time and attention, we won't go through all the parts of this proof but you are welcome to pause the video and think about what is written here on the slide. I'll just point out the outline we envisioned for this proof uh, does end up working. The proof goes by telling how to map automorphisms of Zn to elements of U of n. We then show that that correspondence really does produce elements of U of n. We show that it does so in a one-to-one -one and onto way. And then we show that it's uh, operation preserving the details of that last part will be uh, left to you. It's not that difficult to, to figure out. 
In other words, we do show that the function defined at the beginning of the proof satisfies the requirements of an isomorphism, and therefore this uh, cool theorem really is true. So as we wrap up here, keep in mind the important outcomes listed here. Know what an automorphism is and what ought of G is, and please be familiar enough with these facts about automorphism groups that you can answer questions based on them. Good luck, and I'll be back in the next video.